Welcome back, everyone, to the Cube here in our Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube, with Dave Vellante, my co-host. We're here for the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders event, part of the Cube and our partnership with NYSE Wired Community. Christopher Walker, here, CEO of Untether AI, former Intel executive. Great startup opportunity here. Great to have you on the Cube. Amazing opportunity, thanks for having me. So infrastructure, obviously going down to the silicon, obviously we've been seeing this for a while. We've been covering the cloud scale. All the hyperscales were doing it. We saw it early on about eight years ago, the movement and Annapurna with Amazon. You know, we've always been talking, okay, silicon, it's going to be another revolution. And Amazon was already building systems behind, behind in their data centers, but now it's going mainstream. You're starting to see the trend towards, okay, Genev AI has kind of woken up to the new platform shift. Uh, and when that shift happens, products are shifting. So all the access in the infrastructure, the data layer is waiting in the wings because it's part of Gen AI. So you're in the middle of that. The chip business is hot right now, but it's not the chips that's around it. And this is a key part of the conversation. So Chris, talk about what you guys are doing right now. What's the company? What was it founded on? What was the mission? And where are you guys at today? Yeah, the, the mission and what Untether AI was founded on was for AI to scale, but really to make the difference in the impact we hope in the world, everything from you know, industrial to automotive autonomous driving to scaling out uh, different, use, different use cases in the data center, you actually have to tackle the power challenge, right? Um, AI inference is, is power hungry. Uh, the traditional architecture, whether it's CPU or now GPU architecture, fantastic for doing the math, fantastic for parallel processing, but power hungry. You spend a lot of energy, upwards of 80, 90% of a chip energy, can be done just moving data through a bus into a cache before you get to the actual compute. Uh, what Untether AI does is we call it at memory computing. We eliminate that cache layer. Uh, we remove the memory wall that so many people talk about. We reduce it to a few fence posts. And so by doing that, you get hyper performant, accurate AI inference, but at fractions of the power. And that's, that was our mission. Right, to get AI to be useful and to truly scale in the way that we all hope, uh, we have to solve the power problem. C can you explain that a, a little bit more color in terms of you saying you get rid of the cache? So what, what do you insert or, or yeah. what magic is yeah. in there to? Uh, the magic is uh, we uh, customize our, our processors for AI uh, and we sandwich it with our own uh, custom SRAM. So we've got memory on the chip and so we have a balanced system where if it's a smaller network, you can run it all on our chip or on a series of our chips. Uh, or if it is a larger model, we have access to external memory as well. But all of our compute banks have direct access to the memory. So you're not going through a, through a, through a cache structure. I love this. So it's synchronous. Synchronous. And, and so not, but not a super large expensive SRAM, but big enough. No, it's uh, you know, fabbed, fabbed on the wafer with, with, the compute, with the compute logic and we're in mature uh, foundry technologies. Interesting. Wow, so, you, yeah. so the energy piece is a differentiator because you're saving what that trip into the compute. You're you're saving the trip in from the compute and the trip back out from from the results. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a very very highly parallel uh, spatial architecture uh, that allows you to do very fast computation. Uh, our banks can compute independent of each other, mm -hmm. so you don't have that same dependency or queuing effect, yeah. uh, and a fantastically you know, fast network on chip uh, to be able to move the data in and results out uh, very quickly, very efficiently. That's how you get performance and that's how you keep your energy down. You know, one of the things that we've been excited about for the past year and a half, besides the hype of Gen of AI and the applications that could be intelligent is that we were saying from the beginning, if you remember Dave, we were saying compute storage and networking, the holy trinity of the <laughs> computing industry, if you will, is going to go up, change significantly. Storage works differently for, for reads and writes, whether it's training or inference. Compute is overhead, that's costly, but also important. GPUs, XP, so a lot going on with those three elements because of the different workload requirements that could happen at an, any given time. It's still distributed computing, but it's not, it's a systems problem to solve. And I think this is where you guys are going. So where are you guys at now with the product? Well, first of all, what's your reaction to that? And how would you explain that to a normal person in the industry? Like, okay, what you knew about the industry before, data centers, storage, networking, yeah, it's I different. Think, I think on the compute side, what you used to have, and certainly have a you know, background seeing the rise of the, the CPU and understand a lot on, on, the, on the GPU when it was for graphics and now for, for AI, is 
there was a reason they called them XPUs, right? Is because it was trying to do many, many yeah. things, right? And I think given the size of the market, given the size of the workloads and the, and the difference between them, actually, you know, you know, ASICs are back again, right? Yeah. ASICs are hot again. Know, you know, it's, it's it, it is a little bit of back <laughs> to the future, right? <laughs> and uh, that more purpose-built architecture yeah. uh, for the workload is one of those generational shifts that's come back around to actually make it effective, make it performant. Uh, you're going to need that that leg of the three three-legged stool that you said, so to speak. And so when you do that, uh, it is part of looking at it from an overall system. Uh, when we talk to people from automakers to uh, CIO, CTOs, they look at their whole system. They think about, well, what's the, everything from how do I design you know, a module that can integrate multiple things because things like the car now wants to be software defined, right? I mean, can you imagine, you know, it's very close to the day where people think about the software platform or the compute engine uh, of their car as much as they used to think about well, did I have a 302 or a Hemi yeah, and things yeah. like that, right? <laughs> uh, um, so under that, the hood, that's new meaning. Yeah, under the hood <laughs> is, is definitely new meaning. Uh, you know, people who are looking at how do I deploy uh, AI cases in my enterprise? Well, they're in the business of deploying AI to make their operation run better, not to operate a data center if they have to be on the edge. Yeah. And they don't want to, make some, not everybody wants to be in the cloud. Or if you are in the cloud, how efficient is it? How many gallons of water you know, is consumed in cooling some of these very high-end yeah. GPUs uh, because your team's running a bunch of, uh, you know, chat sessions, right? So reducing the overall footprint of that is very important from an operational standpoint as well. Yeah, I think one of the things is it's true too is that, you know, when you look at the um, what cloud has done, cloud growth has caused all the enterprises to at least have a hybrid cloud. Right. So cloud operations, cloud native has got that platform engineering uh, driver. But now you got Gen of AI, every company we talk to is literally looking at resetting their entire foundation of their entire architecture of the company because everything's going to be software enabled. Yet at the same time, they also recognize because of their work with cloud native, they understand end-to-end -end workload scoping. Right. So the idea, remember the over-provisioning problem, I go to the cloud for elasticity, you're seeing this, this mindset of, okay, systems revolution, What's my foundation? Let's get the Gen AI intelligent apps. But well, we actually know what the workloads look like. Our banking app has been out for a while. Right. So end to end gives you visibility into how to apply unique design. This is where I think the inference is interesting because inference will always be a feature. It doesn't go away. Right, I yeah. mean inference is how you know, you've spent millions and millions of dollars under, under billions of um, you know, compute uh, infrastructure to develop a model. Now you got to run it. Yeah. And that's the bread and butter, right? It's OpEx, right? So I care about yeah. tokens per second per watt per dollar, yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's how much is it going to cost me to run this? So there are, you know, you know, fantastic opportunities for efficiency and to improve people's service. But at the end of the day, it's got to be more effective to run than the, you know, suite of people you have or the, the types of applications you have today yeah. to migrate them it has to make sense on all vectors. It's interesting, before, I know Dave's got a question, I want to jump one more question here. You mentioned uh, tokens per second and, and per power. There's a lot of benchmark FUD out there right now on inference, so I want to get your thoughts on this because I can throw more power at it and make my benchmark look good. Um, so how, what is the actual benchmark um, standard? Because it's not tokens per minute, but Watt's important too, right? You, what's the, somewhere, yeah. Some are hiding the ball here. I won't read the fine print in some of the yeah, benchmarks. It's, it's that, uh, and you're smiling because you know what I'm saying. No, no, I mean, you, you, yeah, you've, yeah. Gone, you've gone, you know, I've gone through this in, in many different segments <laughs> from you know the old adage, uh, uh, lies, damn lies, and benchmarks, right? That, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So but but, uh, but it, what's, what's, what's important there is there are industry standards, right? There are uh, things that have rigor like mm -hmm. uh, MLPerf where, where there's, there's criteria, there's peer review of it. There's things like that that have a, a stringency to it. Now it's not all encompassing overall yeah. workloads. And so I think, you know, in some of these cases, is there's so many other variables of, you know, what's your input and output token lengths and things like that. So it, it's almost- it's Contextual. It's, it's almost contextual. It's almost the job of, you know, a, a class of reviewers, a class of analysts, you know, a class of technologists to help understand the story. Now, for the most part, we're talking about, you know, inside the, uh, the technology uh, knowledgeable and, and companies, right? So you have the resources to go yeah. do that and, and, dig, and dig in. But 
at the end of the day. Buyer beware, look at the benchmarks, be skeptical, look at the spec. I think you want to look at benchmarks that are established, you know, with, with established criteria and transparent criteria. And then you want to go into well, what matters to you, because that's going to that's going to vary by whether I'm on the edge in you know a, a tractor in a field trying to use vision systems mm -hmm. uh, to automate uh, tasks like weeding, to whether I'm in a car trying to do level four autonomous driving, <laughs> or whether I'm you know running my my banking fraud detection. So let's get into that a little bit because uh, the question I wanted to ask you: I'm looking at your website and yeah. looking at your products, and I'm seeing. Ag, uh, the Speed AI 240 Slim Accelerator Card for Ag Tech, Automotive, Vision AI, Government, yeah. and then you've got uh, uh, other products that are maybe geared toward financial, Vision AI, et cetera. So you started to mention some of the workloads. What are the commonalities across those? Yeah. And help us understand yeah. a little in a little bit more detail those, those workloads and those use cases. So we're on our second generation of silicon. Uh, it's uh, called the Speed AI family. Mm -hmm. And we ship in, you know, package parts or standard card form factor. And what the commonality for those markets are, they're using, they're using vision, they're using object detection, different neural networks uh, to do uh, item classification, to help uh, you know, a drone or a car steer or see. But what's common across them is I need you know, very fast performance. So when we talk edge, I would call it more of a, a, heavy, a heavy edge, right? I mean, the kind of Industrial edge. The kind of performance yeah, yeah. we have is, you know, two pet ops, right? Just yeah. to go back to the benchmark <laughs> thing, but um, as, a, as a common one. Yeah. Uh, so it's things where you're trying to do multiple networks together, very complex networks, uh, high throughput, right? These are things that have to be done on the edge that can't be done on the cloud because of latency. And then because, you know, you need to be in higher and higher definitions, you know, bigger image sizes that compute performance enables people to do things they couldn't do. Space is an interesting one, right? You know, up in uh, satellites now need to be able to do collision avoidance. It's kind of crowded up there. They need to be do real-time decision-making. <laughs> uh, the sensors in the imagery is such that the size of the data is so big, you can't go back down to and process it terrestrially, right? They need to do it on, on mission. Mm -hmm. That's the opportunity for better performance. And when you're in better performance, there's two things. What's the energy consumption? But most importantly, associated with that is what's the heat generated from the chip too. And so we talk about energy a lot of times of um, you know, power consumed. It's also heat generated. And the commonality is many of these cases, they're form factor constrained, yeah. right? Whether you're an auto, you're the compute box in a construction or autonomous um, agricultural input, implementation, if you're in a satellite, all those need computation with lower power because they value uh, the form factor as well. And they're not necessarily convenient places to get to. Exactly. In case something it's goes. hard to do a brake fix in oh, space. Yeah. <laughs> and what, it's, not your, it's not your data, I mean, it's not your, your, your business, but what happens to all that data? Is that data being persisted? Is it being thrown away? In, in many cases, you know, this data is data is the, the great the great gift that we all have that yeah. you have to figure out how to how to how to use it and unwrap it. Uh, it's you know you have a task of what there's so much information coming in. The what AI is about and why you need inference and acceleration is to make sense of it and make use of it mm -hmm. quickly, rather than storing it and chugging it chugging on it offline and getting a result sometime later. Uh, the impact is to do it real time. And you might take a little bit of that data and send it back to the cloud, yeah, trickle right. it back. Right. But the vast majority is ephemeral. Yeah. Chris, what, what's the vision for the company? Where are you guys at now? Size, funding, obviously you guys got second generation product, um, got some verticals that are popping for you guys. What's the, what's the plan? What's going on? The opportunity for us is with our second generation silicon, you know, we, we always like to talk about silicon. I'm, I'm equally proud of the software development kit yeah. that we that we ship to customers uh, this year and go into production with along with this along with the silicon. It's a software, uh, software so, company. Right? Yeah, yeah. We we actually I have more software engineers than hardware engineers, right? And it's a great point of pride for us too. Uh, so the vision is, we get this current generation product, we make an outsized impact into the 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 edge the edge market with it, yeah. an unprecedented level of performance and performance with with, with power. That's going to unlock yeah. so many new use cases um, in industrial, 
uh, autonomous vehicles, other applications. I'm really excited about where that product takes us and enables the promise of what AI can do uh, on, on the edge. We can build on that architecture into multiple, multiple segments, multiple configurations. Uh, the really cool thing about our product and being a spatial architecture, it's very easy to cut and resize it and, yeah. and configure it with our customers. In many cases, we will do uh, you know, semi-custom or in partnership with customers, uh, new derivatives of our product, different memory interfaces, different sizes to meet their needs. And uh, I'm a big proponent of partnerships and how you go about that. Yeah. Uh, Auto is a great case for that, yeah. where you know folks like Arm have it have an ecosystem that was yeah. announced. We're part of that, um, and so it's it's a goal as a small company. You have to do ecosystem. We we can foc we focus on building the most performant, the most efficient. Uh, AI acceleration, inference acceleration, and we do work with people small and big uh, to bring it to life. So your success scoreboard, if you will, is partners, ecosystem results, happiness, developers building on top of it. And obviously and the custom, ultimate, ul ul factor, sales. Ul ul <laughs> ultimate measure is vol volume scale. <laughs> volume sales. Volume scale, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if you have a healthy, robust, you can, but developers going fr feeding frenzy right now with generative AI, but they're waiting it's like, you can see the pent up energy, like they're, they're feeding on the Llama models, open source, uh, you're seeing data in the, in the enterprise, private AI. So people are kicking the tires, moving, the, they're getting in there, but yet the big functionality is still coming. It, right, so for all the billions that have been spent and the intention that's spent on training or um, you know, cloud-based or hyperscaler-based uh, generative models, we're really just at the tip of the iceberg, right? The next wave is over the next four or five years a hundred billion dollars of inference silicon that's available yeah. in the market. I mean, inference is the brain. I mean, like, inference is what you do, how you apply learning. Absolutely. And Wait, that's going to be part of the application. That hundred billion is kind of the TAM that you're looking at? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, congratulations on your success. All it takes is 1%, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be watching. We'll certainly we'll hit you up for, for, for more follow-up. But again, we love this area. We think it's not even spring training yet. It's in this market. You're starting to see people wake up to the redesign. Every enterprise, again, we talk to that's serious about the future of Gen AI knows that if they're not on the right side of history with intelligent apps, and they know they've got some little bit of time, they're, gonna, they're resetting. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we're excited for this phase of the industry and this phase for us as a, as a company. Uh, you know, we've had this vision of making the most efficient, you know, solve the problem of scale, and we're, we're, we're ready to do it. On Tether AI, great name too. Chris, thanks for coming on. Thank you guys. Okay, welcome back to theCUBE on another interview after this short break. How about the studios? The Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leader Program. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.